Okay, so we're now live and recording. And I cannot minimize my suit. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, so my name is Mary Jo Musgrave and my co-host tonight is Dylan Yates. And we're first gonna begin with our diversity welcome and land acknowledgement. So first off, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the Peace and Friendship Treaties of 1725. The treaties did not deal with surrender of the land, but did set out the rights and responsibilities that settlers and Mi'kmaq people owe to one another. As such, we are all treaty people. I'd also like to take a moment to welcome everyone today, regardless of your race, culture, nationality, faith, gender, sexual orientation, age, ability, or income level. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Dylan to introduce our guest speakers. Hi and welcome. Um, so excited to have Watch for Wildlife uh, here this evening. We have Sam and, and Taylor and they're going to talk about the Watch for Wildlife program uh, that is uh, was established under the Sierra Club Atlantic. Um, so a little bit about Watch for Wildlife. I won't get into a huge uh, description of it, but um, so basically the program is a collision prevention program, program which uh, was established to help reduce injury and mortality of wildlife people on the roads and to encourage implementation of wildlife friendly road design and vehicle collision mitigation measures. So before I pass things off to Sam and Taylor, I just thought it would be cool to start off with a little bit of an icebreaker and uh, just get uh, to see what is your favorite wildlife species and why. So I'll start off with myself. Uh, my favorite species is a beaver. Um, maybe a lot of people don't really like beavers, but I love beavers. Uh, mainly because they're of their family structure and how they work together uh, in, in the environment. They're, um, I, I observe them quite often. And I mean, one time I, I walked down to the, to the riverbank and uh, there was a big old beaver in, in, the, in, the, in the brook and slapped his tail. And then to my right, I heard a, a big, big a, another big beaver running through the woods. So they have a, a really great warning system uh, to let their buddies know that uh, danger is nearby. So uh, we'll, we'll move on to Sam uh, and uh, yeah. Definitely, beaver's a good one. Um, for me, unfortunately, I've never seen one in person, but uh, my favorite wildlife are um, capybaras. Um, and the reason for that is they tend to be friends with almost every animal. Um, they're mostly in South America, but they're definitely my favorite uh, wildlife for that reason. Um, I'll hand it to Taylor next. So um, my favorite species is probably giraffes. I just think they're really interesting, their behavior. <laughs> um, I don't know if anyone else wants to talk about their favorite wildlife species. Um, I'll go ahead and say mine. Mine are fox or foxes, I suppose, but that's mostly because every year there's a litter born near our house and the babies are just so cute and chaotic. And I guess I'll hand it to Sophie. I'm gonna have to say that mine are groundhogs. I know that's like a really weird species to say, but they're just so adorable and they're so fat when they run. And also they hibernate. They're one of the only, like one of the only species that actually like truly hibernates. So I find that really interesting. And Alyssa, if you wanna say anything. Um, well, so my favorite animal would probably be a raccoon. I think raccoons are uh, super adorable um, and maybe not um, maybe not ones I should approach as much as I want to, but I, uh, I do love them. Gretchen, if you'd like to share. Oh, you're muted. I was just gonna say I'm in a messy kids bedroom, but uh, excuse the background. Yeah, I'm uh, Gretchen and uh, I'm uh, National Programs Director with Sierra Club. Um, and I can't pick a favorite, but I guess my favorite for this summer is ladybugs um, because my daughter and I did some exploration when the schools were shut down and I actually learned a lot more about their life history than I knew. So it was 
it was an eye opener for a creature that's been around my me my whole life and yeah we found their eggs and we found their larvae and yeah and they're just cool and they eat aphids that are on my plum trees so that's nice too <laughs> and i have a book called the very grumpy ladybug so i like that too <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks for sharing, everyone. We'll uh, now pass things off to uh, Sam and Taylor, and they're going to talk about Watch Your Wildlife, and uh, yeah, we'll hand things off to uh, Sam and Taylor. Sounds good. Um, so, myself and Taylor have prepared a little presentation that we'll get into. Um, can everybody see my screen okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, uh, we just put together a quick presentation and talked a bit about Watch for Wildlife as a program, what we've been up to this summer, and uh, some of the program's future goals. So just first, a little bit about Watch for Wildlife. We're a wildlife vehicle collision prevention program of Sierra Club, Sierra Club's uh, Atlantic chapter. Our focus is on outreach in order to educate Atlantic Canadians on methods to prevent and respond to wildlife vehicle collisions. And our objective is really simple. It's to reduce injury and mortality of wildlife and people on our roads and to encourage the implementation of wildlife-friendly road design and vehicle collision mitigation measures. Um, one second. Sorry, the, uh, it's just not working to get to the next slide. Oh, there we are. Never mind. Perfect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, so a bit about Watch for Wildlife's history as a project. So it was first started in 2016 in Nova Scotia by Ms. Wanda Baxter, and she was backed by the support of the Sierra Club Atlantic chapter. This was developed in order to try to raise a greater awareness about wildlife vehicle collision prevention and to increase the general safety of our roads for both people and wildlife. After two years of having the program in Nova Scotia, it was successfully expanded to New Brunswick. And recently, Watch for Wildlife has actually sparked dialogue on wildlife vehicle collision prevention, safety, and awareness. Oh, there we go. So a bit about this summer, um, what we've been up to. A big project was releasing our educational video. Uh, it's reached over 2,200 views across all our social media platforms. Um, it's a great video where we talk to some experts about the need um, to increase knowledge on um, wildlife vehicle collisions. So we'll get into that later in the presentation. We've also seen some consistent growth on our social media platforms with the goal of increasing our online presence uh, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, we also run a iNaturalist project, which Taylor's going to touch on in a bit. And as of right now, we've reached uh, 1,159 observations. So that's been really exciting to see. And also, we have an upcoming webinar coming up on August 18th uh, with more details to come, which will be with Gretchen and David. So we're really excited for that. Here is uh, an example of our video. We uh, got it out across all our social medias. Um, yeah. Yeah, so just a bit about iNaturalist. So it is a popular nature app that will enable citizen science. And so basically it kind of just encourages the users to get out into nature, to collect data through pictures or just basic information. And they can just easily submit it um, through their phone and it connects um, through this whole database where everyone else uh, basically globally can find it. And so Watch for Wildlife uses iNaturalist as a way to discover important data on wildlife vehicle collisions. So through posts from the users on our community page, we're able to see which species are around, which species have been more likely to have been involved in a collision and where the collisions are actually common. And so uh, it is very easy to work and you can just basically take a picture and <laughs> you can basically just take a picture and post it um, through the iNaturalist website or app. And um, yeah, you just post it to our page. You can just join our page. If you go to our Instagram, which is just watch for wildlife, 
there's a post actually detailing pretty specifically how to upload and how to join our page. Yeah, definitely check out that tutorial if you want to get involved. It's super helpful. Um, next up, uh, we were planning on showing the educational video that was released uh, this May, I believe. Um, so yeah, I'll just play it for us now. It's a pretty short video, just around four or five minutes, but does a great job of explaining the project and what it's all about. No matter how focused you are, avoiding an animal collision is hard. By the time you see the animal on the road, it's often too late. So how can we prevent these collisions and what do we do after an animal collision? Here in Nova Scotia, our province is full of incredibly diverse environments, landscapes, and wildlife. But with a continuously increasing population, this means more and more roads are being built in and around these environments. With the increasing number of roads come more drivers, which then leads to more accidents. Within Nova Scotia, on average, you are always within 1.8 kilometers of a road. So you can imagine wildlife trying to go about their daily needs, you know, all of these actions are going to take them across large areas of the landscape. And in trying to access all these different resources, they are going to be coming across roads and crossing roads. It's inevitable. So when we run the figures and compile the figures at every year end, we see what percentage of the animals come to Hope for Wildlife due to being hit by a car. That number has grown over the years. Um, now it's the second biggest reason we see animals in at Hope for Wildlife. When it comes to avoiding or managing these collisions, one option is to build wildlife crossings. Much like an overpass or pedestrian walkway, these wildlife crossings would allow animals to travel freely over or under our roads. What is really important is to have some coordination between the wildlife people and the transportation people when it comes to governance and planning and managing roadways and wildlife. Uh, one important initiative that's starting to happen now is putting in wildlife underpasses. There are a lot of advantages to these tunnels in the sense that they mitigate animal collisions and allow animals to reach new ground for resources or breeding that may have been cut off by new roads. So how can we help decrease the risk of wildlife vehicle collisions while driving on a daily basis? First off, be aware. Most collisions occur at dawn or dusk, so be extra careful around these times. Scan ahead. You can often see an animal or their eyes reflecting in the light of your headlights in time to break and avoid a collision. Slow down, but never stop suddenly or swerve on the highway. Brake gently, give the wildlife time to get out of the way if it's safe to do so. Swerving can be dangerous to you and others and should only be considered when preventing collisions with large animals like deer, bear, and moose. Watch your speed. Most collisions happen when traveling over 80 kilometers an hour. Driving at a manageable speed and paying attention is the best way to prevent these collisions. Honk. It is okay for you to honk your horn if you see wildlife on or near the road or as you drive through areas where you often see wildlife. Wildlife often travel in groups or with their babies. If you see an animal on or near the road, keep an eye out for others or many others. So if you have the misfortune of colliding with an animal, you should always find a safe area to pull over so you're not impeding traffic in any way and go and check on that animal. I always encourage people to carry a cardboard box, a blanket and a pair of gloves with them. It doesn't take up much room in your trunk and it comes in really handy for cases like this because it does happen more often than you think. And so go and check that animal, make sure it's still alive or make sure it's passed away. Two important things, if it has passed, it is important to move it a little bit off the road because other animals will come and feed upon that and then they have the chance of being hit. So, and if it's still alive, gather that an animal ever so gently and carefully with your tools and call a wildlife rehabilitator as soon as you can. While these may sound simple in theory, we all need to do our part to prevent animal collisions and make our roads as safe as possible, not only for us, but for our wildlife. If you're in the unfortunate circumstances of a wildlife collision, always remember to report the accident to the appropriate government organization. In Nova Scotia, this is the Department of Lands and Forestry, if the animal is still alive, also contact the nearest wildlife rehabilitation center. Our job is to kind of work ourselves out of a job someday. I know that will never happen, but the more loopholes that we can close up and the more education we can get out there to prevent these things from happening, the better. No matter how... Alrighty, so that's the, um, that's the video. Um, 
that was really well put together. Sure. Um, next up, I just want to talk about, about um, Watch for Wildlife's future goals, things that we're looking forward to in the future. Um, some things are continuing to increase awareness of impacts of expanding roadways on wildlife. Next up would be get more people reporting wildlife collisions on iNaturalist. Like we were talking about before, we have a great tutorial on our Instagram about how to get started. Next up would be securing a federal commitment to gather data on wildlife collisions and make sure we mitigate impacts on and consider the data in, that data in any future road construction or maintenance that is federally funded. And also just to keep supporting wildlife rescues such as Hope for Wildlife by hop, offering to volunteer. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's it for the projects, I mean, or the presentation that I have. Not sure if anyone has anything. Yeah, thanks so much for, uh, for all that information. It's, uh, I see a lot of uh, these issues here in, in the CBRM uh, along our highways. It's, you know, it's very outdated. We don't have any, any uh, crossings for wildlife, unfortunately, that I can see. Um, you know, there's many, many cases where, where the highways, it's just, it's impassable in some cases for ducks and uh, all kinds of different uh, forms of wildlife. So thank you. Uh, for sharing that. I have a few questions that actually, um, I'm not sure if anyone has any questions we can, uh, I'll ask a few and then we can uh, open up the floor to some questions from the audience. Um, yeah, so my question is how many wildlife crossings are there in Nova Scotia right now, if any at all? I'm not um, really sure to be honest, Gretchen might have a good idea. I'm not sure. That is an excellent question, and it's actually something uh, we've been trying to map, um, and we developed a, a story map. It's sort of a data-linked map uh, that's on our website, ArcGIS website, of, you know, that sort of describes some of the information where wildlife collisions happen, but we do know they made an underpass um, down more the valley way, uh, partly because they were, yeah, well, 100% because they were concerned about wildlife um, collisions and danger to people. And there actually is another one, <clears throat> and it's actually hard to find it on a map. Um, so we know there are a few. It's just really hard to figure out exactly where they are. But if you want to like look on that ArcGIS, they should be at least plotted within a few. Um, within a radius, but, um, and part of the project is kind of encouraging uh, infrastructure and transport to consider making more of these and when they're building a road to plan to, to, to incorporate those. Um, and I think, you know, partly that, that has been successful because we've seen a new underpass since the project was started and we know there's other ones planned uh, for new uh, road expansions, so. So there's no there's no regulations uh, in place to say that you know for every so so many kilometers of roadway you have to have a wildlife crossing whenever you're developing uh, these highways. Is that something that's in place or something that might be in place in the future or something you're striving for? That specific policy we haven't called for. We've definitely um, through the Green Budget Coalition and other calls to action asked for when they're doing an environmental impact assessment of a road, this is one, definitely one of the things that should happen. Um, and it, you know, uh, depending on the size of the road, sometimes there is no impact assessment done or a very low level one. Um, so yeah, so they kind of avoid the level of scrutiny that you might need um, to identify that. We've seen that with some of the road twinning, highway twinnings actually that are happening because they don't trigger the analysis that might be needed. Uh, but definitely one of the things we're looking for is as we go forward and often for big highways anyway, the federal government's involved in funding bits of it, that a condition be made that they have to consider impacts on wildlife, particularly endangered species, but all wildlife, yeah. Yeah, that was kind of my next question. Is there, yeah. is there a form of wildlife that's more vulnerable than others? Like when you, when you, when you talk about species at risk, are there species at risk that are, uh, you know, high mortality here in the province like is there a species in, in specifically that's being affected you know largely by by these uh, unsafe crossings 
Yeah, I mean, if you look at the iNaturalist page, the highest observations that we have actually turn out to be raccoons. <laughs> um, so I suppose that could be one. <laughs> also, normally deer and elk are um, very commonly seen in wildlife vehicle collisions. And especially in Nova Scotia, if you would have likely heard about it um, more so in April and May. Um, but there are four um, species of turtles that are native to Nova Scotia. And um, turtles need to cross the road often, but they are unfortunately quite slow. Um, and so um, those species of turtles are definitely at greater risk when they're trying to um, cross the road. Um, I had a question. Hey guys. Oh, go ahead, Dylan. Yeah, I was just, this will be my last question, I promise. I'm just wondering, is there a number uh, as to how many, how much wildlife is, is uh, killed due to vehicles in Nova Scotia each year? If there was one, it's likely that it would be, um, I, I'm not sure if there's an exact number, maybe there is, but if there was one, it's likely that it wouldn't be very accurate because of the lack of reporting, which is one of the things that the pro program is really striving to do is to get this data of these wildlife collisions. Um, Gretchen, I'm not sure if there is one, but if there was, it wouldn't be very accurate, I suppose. Yeah, that's exactly right. So um, if there's over $2,000 damage to your vehicle, then <laughs> often, you know, there's, there's, you know, police are involved and things like that. And then that collision might get reported in a database somewhere, but, and so that's often would you would assume askew skew that towards you know collisions with deer collisions with moose things like that so yeah they are wildly underestimated um so it's it's hard to put a number on it but there are some times when there's um you know for some counties there can be you know hundreds maybe more collisions happening every year so it's even with that reporting level so it's it's quite common actually but it's, it, as Sam said, it's a real underestimate too. Um, so I was just wondering, and may not be able to answer this, but it's something to think about. Uh, how far behind are we from, like, compared to other provinces when it comes to implementing safe areas for wildlife to cross roadways? So um, I'm not sure about other provinces, but probably Canada's best example of a place that has done well with um, wildlife vehicle like um, overpasses and underpasses would be Alberta, primarily because of the infrastructure in the National Park. Um, they're world renowned for their underpasses and overpasses. And there's a great stat. Um, so they have like 38 underpasses, I believe, and six overpasses. And since they've implemented a combination of fencing and these underpasses and overpasses, they've managed to reduce wildlife vehicle collisions by around 80% and for deer and elk alone by 96%. So that's a great example of another province in Canada doing that. I'm not sure about how we stack up against other provinces. And obviously in Alberta uh, with Banff National Park, there's a great need for that where roads are going through this great big national park. Um, but that would be a province that does phenomenally well in this case, yeah. Yeah, Alberta also developed um, an app kind of like iNaturalist where you can track um, collisions more accurately almost. And so that's something that another province has implemented too that uh, hopefully more provinces can implement. Hmm. Um, so does the provincial and municipal government work together to ensure safe crossings for wildlife? Or should they work together, maybe? Is that a better question? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Taylor and Sam could answer, but yeah, to our experience, they could be definitely working more together. And, you know, municipal leaders often encounter this when they build a road and they haven't factored it in. So people may recall, I don't know, if you were in Nova Scotia a couple of years ago or a few years ago, there was a some issues in Truro where wildlife were kind of getting trapped by the busy highways and they were you know couldn't get out of the downtown or you know and you know there were accidents occurring and also just 
strange occurrences of you know large deer mostly like deer you know in the you know in the downtown park kind of thing so victoria park so it creates a problem for them both a safety issue but also like animals are actually trapped by the roadways we're building and not considering how is it affecting typical patterns um so and then there's other issues you know just with signage and things like that and i guess another example would be the the sprawl that we've seen in halifax definitely when new subdivisions go up we've heard anecdotally um there definitely are an increase in accidents and collisions with wildlife because again they haven't factored in you're going into habitat <laughs> um, when you're creating these new subdivisions and so forth and then unfortunately they go down because you know obviously we've we've destroyed that habitat or that connectivity for those wildlife so again if it was factored in better and you know as sam and taylor mentioned it's particularly urgent for for turtles and uh, other species that are endangered then a we might not be developing in some of these places but b we'd be planning for it um together so yeah there definitely should be more coordination with how we're uh building our municipalities and then actually then how the infrastructure itself has you know does it have an underpass is there a sign that says turtle crossing you know um or is the speed limit appropriate things like that yeah um there's a question in the chat here from sam mcwilliams says barrier fencing is pretty popular along the highways in new brunswick how does the price compare between fencing and overpasses slash underpasses yeah so overpasses and underpasses are actually really really expensive to build and to create infrastructures however there are new plans being developed that do make them more affordable um, but that being said they still are a pretty hefty price which is why we kind of have to keep bargaining for the government to try to incorporate them um, so in terms of comparing the price between the barriers like the ones in new brunswick and the overpasses and underpasses it would probably be less expensive to just incorporate the fencing. However, the overpasses and underpasses would likely be a little more effective. Um, it looks like Sophie has a question there, so I'll just let her speak. Um, so Gretchen, you were mentioning how it's hard for animals sometimes get out when they get trapped in the city. So how do you feel about having some sort of governing, not governing body, but like some sort of like a police force for animals that in, that can go out and like save the animal. Because I know recently there was a moose that was trapped. I'm not in Nova Scotia, I'm in Ontario. Um, ah, so yeah. Moose problems. Um, and there was a moose trapped on the highway and instead of like getting the moose to safety, they just killed it. So I'm um, uh. like, what do you think about having like a, a specific type of responding body that can safely remove the animal instead of just killing it to get rid of it oh that sounds like a real shame um i'm from newfoundland where moose are a huge <laughs> problem so i know that for collisions and yeah moose go into communities too and um yeah it i've seen joking stories about them wandering around in communities and i'm like it's not a joke for the wildlife involved <laughs> uh they're yeah. usually pretty distressed and they want to get out of there um so yeah, I mean, I don't know a devoted, definitely we work with or partner with part, uh, wildlife rescues like Hope for Wildlife and others in the region who, you know, do a lot of education about what you should do. Um, I guess what we're trying to encourage is people, if you see, you know, are involved in a collision, but there is a responsibility for the, yeah, the province to come in and, and act and they should be trained up not to, you know, to use lethal <laughs> measures if it's avoidable and if safety you know of the public is is you know is insured or protected um so yeah i think it would be more like training up existing responders whether it's natural resources you know the numbers that you can call that are on our brochures um if you do have an encounter with wildlife or god forbid a collision um yeah like those folks should be trained up on a proper response so i i guess i'd be more in favor of better response and better partnership with wildlife rescues because they often have the skills and the, in some ways, the capacity through their volunteer base and through their trained, you know, vets and things like that to, to help out maybe government officials that respond. I don't know um, what Sam or, or uh, Taylor would say. But. 
I think you covered that pretty well. Yeah, you covered it really well. Uh, so I think you probably answered this already, but just to be super clear, who's primarily responsible for the safety of wildlife on Nova Scotia roadways? Yeah, that's a good question. Great question. Um, <laughs> yes, there wouldn't be one direct responsibility. Um, there's responsibility on driver to um, make sure that they're aware while driving, knowing when they're passing through an area that um, where there's more wildlife when it's dark, just keeping that awareness. But then there's also um, a responsibility to when responsibility to government when a problem is recognized to act on it and realize that some action can be done to help the problem. Um, so I would I would say that there's a shared responsibility in it. Okay, that's a good answer. Um, so the iNaturalist app, how much data have you guys collected so far on that since you started the project? Yeah, so basically the iNaturalist app itself has been pretty successful. Um, we've accumulated about 1,200 observations total on the app. Um, so just by observation, we just mean whether it be picture or just a description someone's posted about something they've seen or um, encountered. Um, and yeah, like I said, raccoon's the most popular and um, porcupine is actually the second most popular as well. So yeah, those are kind of our iNaturalist stats have it up now we're also we've also had 366 different observers so we're always hoping to see that number go up to have different people using the app and the program and 184 different species so yeah those are some naturalist stats <laughs> yeah i guess that was my next question when i thought of this originally i was thinking like deer and like coyotes and yeah. like big animals but is it all animals that you're looking to be reported like even a crow and like a tiny little chipmunk yeah, for sure. And uh, that those are actually the accidents that go unreported the most often is like the smaller ones that wouldn't cause damage because if someone hits a small animal and causes no damage to their car and they're in a rush, chances are they're not going to report the incident. Yeah. Um, and so they go unreported a lot of the time. And so that's why iNaturalist is so important to us to try to decrease the number of unreported accidents. I feel like every day when I drive on the road, I see at least one, you know what I mean? Whether it be on a rural road or a highway, and I don't even think of it most of the time. So this yeah. is definitely something. I'm going to be a new user. <laughs> awesome. That's great. And it's true. It, it would be cool if, if you can safely do it, obviously, but to, yeah, report it over time if you can at the same stretch of road. You know, like if you're traveling the same, that would be really cool because you could see how it changes and, and get better data. And one of the things we're asking federally is that the federal government fund a national database, but this can be a piece of it too, is that citizens are reporting what they see and, you know, if they're gonna, you know, change your road or if they're gonna upgrade your road or if they're gonna change the speed limit on your road, this is like important information, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Sophie had a question in the chat there. It says, is iNaturalist I national? I've had the app for years, but I'm in Ontario. Yeah, it is. Um, you can actually make reports from anywhere you'd like. Um, we typically track Atlantic region, but we also do keep an eye out for other places. Awesome. Yeah, who was it developed by? It was developed some university in the States, I believe. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's a um, pretty, pretty big app. So yeah, I guess everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, so we have a Facebook question here. Um, so then we'll get it. Does the Department of Lands and Forestry, hmm, is the Department of Lands and Forestry responsible for helping the animals to leave? Uh, city of animals struck on the highway and is there a program to help teach our law enforcement officers and firefighters to help mitigate these situations? So I'm not sure if he means there, so sometimes I guess if there's wildlife struck and it's still on the highway, not removed, but it, it attracts other wildlife. I think that's what he's, what he's getting at. So is there a program in place to help teach law enforcement officers and firefighters to help mitigate these situations? So um, yeah, I don't know if you guys can answer that or not, but that came through Facebook there. 
not that I am very aware of. Um, so I, I can't say definitively whether or not um, those like law enforcement people would be um, given training on what to do in that case. I can't, yeah, I don't have a definitive answer. Yeah, I'm not sure about that either, to be honest. Does anyone have any other questions uh, that there is? Um, let me see. I need another question from Facebook. Oh no. If no one has any questions, I can tell. I can. Uh, I have a little story about this time when me and my friend were, were driving home one evening and he clipped a bobcat and it was unconscious. So we put it in the trunk to take it off the road and, and take it home and, and contact authorities. So by the time we got home and we went to open the trunk, the bobcat was like alive and awake and was like flying at us. And we were like, slam the, <laughs> slam the trunk shut. And we were like, what do we do? So we called in the lands of forestry and we ended up waiting like what seemed like forever, at least four to five hours before they showed up. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you find, do you recommend transporting a wildlife such as like bobcats? <laughs> It was a pretty scary. Oh my situation. goodness! Yeah. <laughs> you had like the worst case story. scenario. I mean, uh, everybody has a story of a collision with wildlife, but that's uh, <laughs> yeah, and it was like that's uh, that's up there. <laughs> that's uh, uh, one of the ones that I, like, unfortunately, I've been in a few little collisions, but that was one that really stuck out. It was uh, yeah, it was something else. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> So when you so right. you guys have numbers and all that for people to call if, if they do encounter. So if you if you encounter if you you know encounter a deer or something like that, is it the police that you would call, or is it the land in forestry? Yeah, I'm just putting up the post now of like who to call in different provinces and things like that. Okay. Um, yeah. So if you you know, um, I yeah, and I guess we recommend if the animal is suffering or you know still alive then you know call a wildlife rescue and in the case of your bobcat situation <laughs> just to answer that one um probably they would have recommended maybe don't put it in the back of your car <laughs> you know and they can guide you through because you know those folks are familiar with quite a few scenarios so that, that one would be pretty unique um and then we recommend you call that you know natural resources to let them know this is happening and and also um transportation and infrastructure in nova scotia anyway because then you can ask that the collision be recorded in their database because that's again we're, we're really big on data with this project and trying to improve like what what is known um, um so and obviously if you're in you know if if it's a large animal um, and is in distress, then you should try to call the local police, the RCMP, because you know, if it's if it's not going to make it, it would be good to have it put out of its misery too. Um, yeah, so that's a lot of calls to make. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it can help in the end, like prevent future collisions, and and hopefully, if the animal could survive then the animal rescue folks can help with that piece yeah and i guess the other reason to call the rcmp or the local police is is has been mentioned by the person on facebook is it you can um you know if you know the the, the animal needs to be taken off the road too because it's a it is a hazard to other drivers and may attract other other wildlife so um, Alyssa had a question in the chat here. It's what are the best ways people, I'm sorry, what are the best ways for people to support Watch for Wildlife and their mandate? Yeah, so you can follow us on all of our social medias. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. It's just Watch for Wildlife. And you can also go to our website, which is just watchforwildlife.ca. And you can also support us through there. And if you'd like to make any donations, you can also do that as well through Sierra Club Canada Foundation. Awesome. Oh, there and Dylan put the Facebook in the chat so you can find it very easily. Okay. Um, so I think that's it, unless anyone else has any other questions. Dylan, do you have anything? Oh. 
And folks may be aware of this already if you know the project, but we do have bumper magnets and, and brochures. So if you'd like one, we'd be happy to send one to you as well. That can go on the back of your car. That's an awareness raising thing. And the brochure go, can go in your glove compartment so that you have the numbers at hand in case you are in a collision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was great. Uh, great discussion. And, uh, I, I don't think I have any more questions, but uh, if anyone else has any last words or anything they'd like, like to ask uh, Sam and Taylor and Gretchen before they, uh, before they head out, now's the time. Or if you guys have anything else yep. that you want to add that you haven't put out there yet. Yeah, I guess I'll just say thanks for um, having us on. This was awesome to talk more about our project. Um, and I just saw Sophie say in the chat, brochure with numbers is a great idea. Definitely um, check out those brochures on our website. Um, stay up to date with us on all our social medias. And yeah, thanks again for having us on. For sure. Thank you so, so much. Um, so before we go, I just want to leave you guys with one message. Uh, if you'd like to see more coffee houses like this, please consider donating to our network. Since we are a nonprofit, we rely on membership dues, project grants, and in-kind donations from great people like those of you here today. Uh, you can click the link in the chat that will take you directly to our donation page, or you can just visit our website to have a look. If you are unable to make a donation, please consider volunteering with the network so we can continue to bring relevant, important, and up-to-date information and news to you all on things environment related. So thank you, everybody. Ew. And I just put the I just put the link to donate in the chat. I was a little slow on that, so yeah, if you want to head on head on over and, and donate, that'd be.